realized that the reason why Israel was, uh, was in bondage was because of his fathers. He took it upon himself and asked forgiveness of the Lord. But this is a wonderful setting because it's all the Israelites who are taking it upon themselves, confessing to the Lord and asking the Lord to, uh, to correct them and asking the Lord to lead them and guide them to do what's next. Here in verse number 1, let's just uh, look at the verses quickly. I mean, uh, look at the uh, uh, whole chapter quickly and see what our, we can get from this. Verse number 1, it says, Now in the twenty and fourth day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloth and earth upon them. This morning we studied about fasting in our uh, uh, Bible class. And uh, it's very, uh, in, uh, a very interesting subject because um, this is something that is lacking in our Christian lives. And most of us, do not fast and we have learned in our lesson that fasting is not just about eating or not eating uh, fasting is not just about food it's about depriving yourself of uh, pleasures that you enjoy for the sake of spiritual enrichment so that means you can uh, there are different forms of fasting you can also eat but if you the things the other things that you enjoy you have to forego so that you will be able to re be rich spiritually for uh, for couples therefore uh, for not uh, sleeping or not having sex is fasting. Uh, for young people, not doing your recreational activities can be a form of fasting. That means if you enjoy basketball and you decide not to play for a whole month, that is a form of fasting as well. That means you, you deprive of yourself of the things that you normally enjoy in life for the sake of spiritual enrichment. Now here the people are fasting, but we can interpret fasting here as they are not eating. They're only together reading, praising the Lord, and then confessing their sins. That's what they were doing. Not only were they fasting, but they were with sackcloth and earth upon them. Now, this is indicative of mourning, of repenting, of being sad towards something. Nobody died. Actually, they just finished the wall. They should be happy, but they are in a state of mourning. And the reason why they mourn is because of the sins that they have figured out. Because of the sins that they knew. And we, when we realize here that the reason why they knew about this mistake was simply because they read the Word of God. And the only the only also the only reason why we realize our sin, when we realize something is wrong, is because of the Word of God. If not for the Word of God, we will not know what's right from wrong. Now, we will know those simple things, lying, uh, uh, and all of these things. But there are many things that unbelievers do not know are sins against God that believers know. And we know it because we read the Word of God. We know it because we have the Word of God. And because of the Word of God, we realize that even though we look at ourselves as good people, people who go to church, we still really uh, fall very short of the, of the standard of God. We see that however good we are, we may come to church every Sunday, we may, uh, we may go to the outreach, we may spend most of our time serving the Lord, but reading the Word of God, we still fall short of the standard of God. We still realize that it's nothing. Even if I spend my whole life serving the Lord, it's still uh, something that still falls short for God. And that is something that we should be in constant reminder of. Kasi po, minsan, pwede tayo maging self-righteous. Because there, will be, there might be a time when we think that I'm good. I'm good enough. I'm already doing these things. I'm already doing this thing. I think I'm doing enough for God. I should stop. But we realize that if we read the Word of God, no matter if you spend every minute of your life serving the Lord, it's still not up to His standard. Why? Because we still commit sin. Because we still sin against God. Because we still do things that are against the Word of God. Because we still uh, don't give our best sometimes. Because we still don't uh, have the right motive in what we're doing sometimes. And all of these things should make us not just not mourn continually, but should check uh, should make us check ourselves and not to be self righteous and not to be. Uh, um, not to be puffed up, not to be proud of what we're doing, but to be in constant thankfulness to the Lord because He's giving us this opportunity uh, despite the mistakes, despite the sin, despite of all the shortcomings we have. And that is what they were doing here. They were not only confessing their sins, but they realized how good God is despite of the things that they were doing. Now, uh, something here that we should mourn over our sins. If we don't mourn over our sins, we'll not get over our sins. It's not enough just to say sorry. We should be, uh, uh, what do you call this, uh, genuinely mourning over it. If we're not, sooner or later we're going to do it again. 
right? Sooner or later, we're going to fall into the same thing. Why? Because we did not mourn over them. How were they mourning? They didn't eat. They uh, put sackcloth over their heads. And we know what uh, a sackcloth is. It is very uh, itchy, it's irritable, it's not comfortable. And then they were putting earth upon their their body upon their heads. This is a sign of mourning, a uh, deep mourning, something that they only do when they're really, really uh, repenting of something or, 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 they, or, or, uh, or a loss. Now, the people who are mourning, but they don't only do this, but in verses 2 to 5, we see, and the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their father. Not only were they mourning, but when they are really truly repentant, there will, be, there will also be separation. The Bible says here that they separated themselves from all strangers. Now, because of their sins and because of their um, departure from the will of God, what they did was they took wives that are not Israelites. They took wives from uh, different countries that are serving pagan gods. So now they were influenced to do that as well. Even the King Solomon was uh, uh, influenced to do that because of wrong association, because of wrong relationships. Now, because of this, they realizing this, the first thing that they did was to separate themselves from these people. This might be their wives. This might be their husbands. This might be even their children. But they knew that during this time of mourning, it should be only the Israelite people coming together and confessing their sins to the Lord. Why? Because if you don't separate yourselves from people who influence you to do bad things in the first place, again, you're going to repeat doing the same things. Right, let's not think that, okay, I already realized my mistake. I still go with them, but I will not do the same thing. It's not true. Why? Because if you fell for that in the first place, that means you're going to fall for it again. And the, and the obvious thing to do was to separate yourselves from these people. Kaya nga po, pag may mga tao na pinapakarnal ka, layuan na natin. Kaya nga po, if there are people who are influencing us to do something bad, let us separate ourselves from them. Right? Maybe until we get strong enough spiritually to influence them instead. Not them influencing us. And this might be very difficult because this might be your relatives as well. This might be people who are close to you. This might be people who love you. I'm not saying do not talk to them completely, but to have some distance while you are, uh, while you are uh, recovering from the things that you did wrong and while you're asking God for strength to help them. That's why until we're ready, we should not mingle with those people. We should let God strengthen us spiritually so that we'll be able to say no to the things that they might ask us to do. That's why when, when we are, uh, you realize that when you are uh, at church, Saturday, Sunday, you're strong. You think that you cannot do any wrong. But Monday to Friday, you are with unbelievers. And that's when you realize how weak you really are. Like just a little, uh, just a little uh, uh, invitation to do something bad, you fall for it. Right? Just an invitation to go somewhere that is not according to the will of God, you go. Why? Because... Uh, when, 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 we, uh, when we have self-confidence with, with all these things, we realize how weak we really are and we don't rely upon the Lord. That's why the, uh, the people of Israel realize that we have to separate ourselves. Maybe they not only separated themselves from them, but maybe these strangers saw what was happening and they themselves separated themselves away from the Israelites. Why? Because they don't understand what's happening. They read from the Word of God, uh, and the reading, even though uh, some people interpreted it and explained it, they, they sh I'm sure that they don't understand why these people are mourning. Why are these people repenting? Because the, the, uh, these strangers do not know the history of Israel. These strangers do not know the power of God. These strangers do not know the promise of God that, uh, that, that God gave to Israel, and they don't know the sins that Israel did against God. So they don't get it. Why are these people mourning? Maybe they're the ones who really distance themselves from these Israelite people. Now, if you are a believer in Christ and you are really living out the life of a believer, unbelievers will not be comfortable around you. They will never be comfortable around you. Why? Because they do not understand what you're doing. Just, just going to a restaurant with unbelievers, them seeing you pray before you eat, but for them when the food arrives, they eat immediately, they should realize, oh, there's something different with this person. He's weird. I'm not going to eat with him again. Maybe something like that. Or maybe they do something for them, it's okay. They don't know it's against the Bible, but you, uh, but you withdraw yourself from them. For them, it's weird and it's something that's very difficult to understand. So they will not be comfortable around you. They will not like your companionship unless they want to know what you believe. That's why these people, they're separated from the unbelievers. They're separated from these people, from the strangers. And only then can they start really confessing to the Lord. 
their sins and the things that they're doing. Now today, anyway, today our, our, our study is about confession. I'm just setting all of these things uh, uh, in, into context. Now, we, we, we look here in verse 3. It says here, uh, And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord, their God, one fourth part of the day, and another fourth part they confess and worship the Lord their God. <coughs> now we don't know how to interpret this. If it's either they're all doing everything uh, uh, one by one or everyone is doing simultaneously. Some are confessing, some are worshiping. But we all know here that what they're doing, everything that they're doing now is very serious. They're taking it seriously and that everyone is uh, into it and everyone is doing the same thing and that they are, uh, what they call this, uh, worshiping the Lord. Now the verb confess, we can see in verse number 2 and 3. It says here in verse number 2, And stood and confessed their sins. In verse number 3, And another fourth part, they confessed. Now the whole confession, we can see in verse, in verse 6, until the, end, the very end of the chapter. Now, the Hebrew language has a broader sense of the word confession. Because in our time, when you say confess, that means you admit to something that you did wrong. Okay, that's why you say, I confess, I, I admit. That's why in the courtroom, when you say that he confessed, to something that means he admitted that he's the one who did it and when we say the word confess that's what comes to our mind it's negative or positive or because someone admitted or told the truth but to that person that means that he did something wrong that is confessing but here in this chapter we have read a while ago in chapter 6 uh, verse 6 to 37 that their confession is not just about the sin actually that is secondary their confession is more about confessing the goodness of god confessing the greatness, the faithfulness, the grace, and the mercy of God. That is primarily their confession. And their, the faith, the faith and the faithfulness of God, their faith towards God. And secondarily, their sins, the sins that they're doing. Now, let's look here uh, at, the, at the format from verse 6 to, thir uh, to 37. Just for, I will not read each verse. In verse 6, they, re they, they recognize the Creator. They started their confession by recognizing the Creator. That He is God. He's the one who made heaven and earth. He's the one who made them. He's the one who's controlling and He's sovereign. Now in verse 7 and 8, they, they, they mention the covenant with Abraham. In verse 9 to 12, their deliverance uh, from, from Egypt. In verse 13 to 15, the Messiah covenant that God and, and the law that God has established. And from verse 16 to the rest of the chapter, it's an alternate before, uh, of their sin and God's forgiveness, their sin and God's mercy, their sin and God's goodness. It's an alternate of that. And we have read that a while ago. And I'm sure that as you're reading, you're praising the Lord and looking at your life, that as we see the Israelites being people who are hard-headed, people who are stiff-necked, people who are always going back to the same old sins, same old habits, we realize that as uh, sometimes we we condemn them for doing that. But we have to realize that we, uh, we do the same thing as well just in a different form although these israelites are doing these uh, sins over and over again god forgiving over and over again god is doing the same thing to us and when we look at the old testament we always say that god in the old testament is a terrible god that he punishes sin he kills people who commit sin but what we overlook was god's amazing grace towards them that in in one verse we have read a while ago that god should have consumed these people all together because of their hard-headedness, because of the sin that they do over and over again. We see at the last, uh, very last part of the chapter that they even kill the prophets of God. The people who God sent to save them, to warn them of their sins, they kill. Why? Because they don't want to listen. They, and then after that, they turn back to God, God forgives them. And then they do the same thing. And then they turn back to God, God forgives them. And then they do the same thing over and over and over again. And though God did kill a lot of these people because of disobedience, but God's grace is being overlooked. Why? Because God was very merciful towards these people. And God is very gracious even until now. He's protecting them. Even until now, His hand is upon them. Even until now, His protection is upon them. Why? Because God is gracious throughout the whole Bible. Throughout the whole Bible, we see the grace of God. Even though Adam and Eve sinned against God, He still provided for them. He's still the one who, who's, uh, from that moment on, the human being fell into sin. He's still the one who made a way for us to be saved uh, in the New Testament. Even though us ourselves, you look at your lives, you, you do the same thing over and over and over again, yet you're still here. God's still counting you faithful to do the ministry of God. God is gracious. And when we are confessing, we should not forget the part to confess how good God is. 
Now the the uh, uh, one verse number thirty three it says here, and it summarizes the whole thing. Howbeit thou art just in all that is brought upon us, for thou hast done right, but we have done wickedly. That summarizes your life as well. God has done right, we've done wrong. God has been faithful, we have not been faithful. Because the moment we say that I've done right, I have been faithful, I have been good, I have done correctly, that's the moment when you're, fall, you're going to fall into pride. We always have to realize that we have done wrong. And though you're not doing things wrong now, but you have done wrong. And you will continue to do wrong things in the future. But God will continue to be faithful. And God will continue to be gracious in your life. And that's one way for us to um, appreciate that. And just one way for us to always be uh, mindful and conscious of that. So that we will, uh, um, uh, dito, uh, we will try to uh, avoid most of the sins that we are, we are going to do to the Lord. Now, Lord, you are just. Lord, you are faithful. We have done wickedly. And that sums up the, as well the life of the believer. Here in uh, verse uh, 34 to 35, it says, Neither have our kings or our princes or our priests nor our fathers kept thy law nor hearkened unto thy commandments and thy testimonies wherewith thou didst testify against them. Verse 35, For they have not served thee in their kingdom and in thy great goodness that thou give, gavest them and in the large and fat land which thou gavest before them. Neither turn they from their wicked, wicked works which led them to... Uh, Saying now, when they were confessing their sins, goodness of God. Here in uh, the later part of the chapter, which led them to confess that their present situation was a consequence of those sins. Now, this is something we can learn as well. Sometimes we mourn or we are sorrowful with our situation. Why is this happening to me? Why God allow? Why did God allow this? Why are these people doing this to me? We have to be careful to realize: is this a test? Or is this a consequence of the things that I've done wrong? Because if we know the difference between the two, then the sooner we can move on. Like if the things are happening because it's a consequence of my mistake, then you learn. But if we, have, we fall into self-pity, Oh Lord, why is this happening? I'm doing faithful things to you. Then we'll never really learn the mistakes. For example, you're sick. You're, you, you, you have to be at home for a few days. You can't work, you can't go to church. When you realize that you did not really take care of your body, that's why you're sick. When you get well, you're going to uh, do a better job taking care of yourself. But if you just realize, now oh, God is just, uh, you know, testing me, you, nothing will change. You know, that's what we have to realize that. Um, these people realize this. Now, Lord, because of these things that our forefathers did, we are now in this situation. This is a consequence. It's though not our sins... Uh, 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 literally, though it's the sins of our fathers, we realize that we are the ones that are uh, reaping them. And we accept that. And the moment we accept God's consequences of our sins, that's the moment we can, we can really move on for God. And we can accept that and not really get down every time that we uh, have these consequences in our life. Verse 36 to 37, Behold, what happened to them? What is their uh, consequence? We are servants this day. And for the land that thou gavest unto our fathers to eat of the fruit thereof and the good thereof, behold, we are servants in it. This is supposed to be the place that we're enjoying, that we love. But because of disobedience, we are the servants in this place. And it yieldeth much increase unto the kings whom thou hast set over us because of our sins. Also they have dominion over our bodies and over our cattle and at their pleasure. And we are in great distress." Now we see here that they are just reaping what they have sowed. And let's look at the, con again, one thing that I noticed here in their confession. They offered zero excuses. No excuses at all. You know, sometimes when we confess our sin and we, we admit our mistakes, there's always a little bit of excuse over there. Uh, uh, Lord, I know I've done wrong. Uh, you know, it's because of this. It's because of that. That is not true repentance. That is not true confession. True confession is admitting your sin, agreeing to God. Lord, I agree. This is wrong. Forgive me. Amen. That's it. Not offering an excuse. When you offer excuse, that means you're not really repentant of your, what you did. You're not really repentant. Uh, uh, sorry because I, I did this just because of this. Just because of that. You're really not... Uh, 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 acquiescing the sin. Uh, you're not really not uh, taking 100% uh, of the blame. You always spread it around. 
we always say that this, uh, this, the reason why I did this is because of all of this collective situation and I had no choice, I have to do it. But there's no such thing. And when we face God someday, the sins that we have done or the things that we have done are not according to His will. We cannot point at anyone else. Now we can say that maybe it's because of weak preaching. Maybe it's because of people who are not teaching me the Word of God. But it's still your duty as well to know all of these things, even without the preaching of the Word of God. That's why we cannot point to people. Now, which, uh, now we notice here that the word confess, again, it's not, this, now this, this, uh, this is just an introduction, but let's look at the word confess again. The word confess is not merely saying your mistakes. The word confess means telling the whole truth, saying the truth, and which, is, which goes us, uh, brings us to our, uh, uh, the title of this morning's message, means to tell the truth. Confess means to tell the truth. Now, telling the whole truth doesn't only mean your sin. Yes, you offer no excuses. Yes, you say the whole thing. Yes, you take the whole blame. But after that, also confess the goodness of God in your life. Confessing. Confessing means you're telling the whole truth. That's why these people, the, when they started confessing to God, they started off praising the Lord. They started off telling the truth. Lord, you did this, created the world. Lord, you gave Abraham the promise. Lord, you did this, you did that. Yet, we committed a mistake. But you were faithful. And then we did this again. But you were gracious. And then we did this again. Because we conf the, uh, one uh, point, the re uh, one uh, reason why we have to confess, or one reason why God makes us realize our sin, is for us to realize His grace as well. It's for us to realize His goodness as well. Because we can never really appreciate God's goodness and grace until we see our sinfulness. If we look at ourselves as righteous people, if we look at ourselves as good people, there's no point re uh, appreciating the grace of God. But if we see uh, the things that where we fall short, that's when we fully appreciate the grace of God in our lives. Now, the title of, again of the message is Confessing the whole or, or to tell the truth. Confession means to tell the truth. Now, here the word confess can more accurately mean to acknowledge, to affirm, to recognize. That is confession. Whatever you recognize, whatever you acknowledge, whatever you affirm, you're confessing. Now, what I'm doing is I'm confessing. I'm telling you the truth in the Word of God. I'm confessing to you the goodness of God and, 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 and whatever we can see here in this chapter. Now, look again at the confession that they did. Let's look at the outline of their confession, of their prayer. God's greatness in creation, covenant, redemption. And then after that, the people's hardening of their necks in verse number 16 and 17. And after that, God's grace. In, uh, let's look at verse number 17b. Uh, 17. And refused to obey, neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didst among them, but hardened their necks, and in their rebellion appointed a captain to return to their bondage. But thou art a God, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and forsookest them not. Now in verse 18, uh, they saw that they're idolatry as well. They confess, yeah, when they had made them a molten calf and said, This is thy God that brought them thee out of the land of Egypt. And then right after they confess their idolatry in verse 19 it says here that yet thou in thy manifold mercies forsookest them not in the wilderness and until verse 25 it's god's mercy they confess about god's mercy and then verse 26 we see another confession of sin which says nevertheless because of verse 19 to 25 his grace and forgiveness Still, nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against thee and cast thy law behind their backs and slew thy prophets which testifieth against them to turn them to thee. And they wrought great, uh, great provocations. And then the very next verse is God's discipline and salvation. Therefore thou deliverest them in the hand of the enemies. Now even in the midst of discipline, God's grace is still there, who vexed them. And in the time of their trouble, when they cried unto thee, what did God do? Thou heardest them from heaven. And according to thy manifold mercies, thou gavest them saviors who saved them out of the hand of their enemies. Verse number 28 says here, But, thou, but after they had rest, they did evil again before thee. Therefore, leftest them thou in the hand of their, their enemies, so that they had the dominion over them. Yet, when they returned and cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven. And many times didst thou deliver them according to thy mercies. Verse number 29. 
about their uh, 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 confessing their hard-headedness and testified against them and that thou mightest bring them again unto thy law. Yet they dealt proudly and hearkened not unto thy commandments, but sinned against thy judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them, and withdrew the, the shoulder and hardened their neck, and they would not hear. And verse number 30 is God's patience and grace. Yet many years didst thou forbear them, and testified us against them by the Spirit in thy prophets. Yet would they not give ear, therefore gavest them down into the hand, into the land of the, uh, 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 into the hand of the people of the land. Now we see here their confession. It's an alternate of their sin and God's forgiveness. Their sin and God's patience. And re in reading this chapter, you, one will make you, this will make you think, why did God, why is God so patient with these people? Why is God so patient with them? Now, God can just choose another nation. God can just wipe them off, choose another nation that may obey His will. But all of these things, the Bible, the whole Bible, is to point towards the glory of God. To point towards the goodness and the grace of God. For us to realize while we are reading this, that God is good and God is gracious. And which will make you think, why is God so patient with me? Why is God so gracious with me? Why is God so merciful with me? Again, it's for you to praise Him, to thank Him, to glorify Him, and then serve Him. That is the reason why. Now, why should we tell the whole truth about ourselves? Number one, telling the whole truth highlights the nature of sin. Telling the whole truth highlights the nature, nature of sin. Today, sin is minimized in our world. Even pedophilia is being People are trying their best, psychiatrists and psychologists, all of these people are studying the human brain. They are trying to find a way to make the world believe that pedophilia is not a choice, but it's something that people are born with. They are already successful with the LGBT community. They are already successful with the world accepting that these people are born this way, that you know it's not uh, really their choice, it's just something they're born with, and the life that they have lived is just something that they're drawn into. It's not really their choice. And the world has accepted that. And sadly, we have been defeated in that part. Of, uh, in that part. We have been defeated. Why? Because most of the world now believe that but even, even I, don't, I don't know, but even most of the Christians in this world believe that. Uh, just just uh, uh, recently, a uh, uh, transgender was accepted you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a church in America, in a Baptist church. Uh, a church that was really fundamentally sound and was a, an old church. But now, they have a transgender in their staff. Why? Because even the church has accepted this fact. They have minimized sin. That's why today we can see that there are pastors who are divorced, remarried, still pastors. Now, in the eyes of the people, it's nothing. It's okay. Right? There's no problem for a pastor divorcing his wife, remarrying, and then pastoring again. And even fellow pastors are the ones uh, giving them that advice. You know, there are pastors who will leave their families, divorce their wives, and go to a big shot pastor and ask for advice. Okay, uh, we have uh, young women here. Marry them. And then I'll send you out, and then you start another ministry. Now, even in the church, sadly, not only in the world, but even in the church, we have minimized sin. We have minimized sin for something that is just normal. Though it's true that sin happens every time in the life of a believer, and it happens uh, every now and then, but we should not minimize the magnitude of sin. Because the moment we minimize the magnitude of sin, that's when it becomes the norm instead of the exception in the church that's when it becomes a, a lifestyle even in the believers though it should never happen in the believers life but because of this uh, 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 the uh, uh, collection of things that are happening around us that is what is happening today and what's more what's uh, sad is that believers even though uh, it's only about uh, uh, we're talking about unbelievers what's more sad is the believers are doing something that is worse why because we are uh, we are not giving importance to the offices in the church anymore. We put people who are, are really uh, not called by God because we have minimized sin. And in here, in uh, um, and, and one thing that we do here as well, the uh, one way that we minimize our sin is when we commit a mistake. Instead of confessing the whole truth to God, we compare ourselves with someone who's doing worse. Nagkamali ako. Ah, yeah, I know it's wrong, but this brother is worse. So comparing myself to him, uh, I'm okay. I'm good. Instead of mourning over your sin, you look at someone more wicked than you and then say, I'm good anyway. 
I'm good. Now, this is uh, a warning in the Bible, 2 Corinthians 10, 12. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that com command themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and compare themselves among themselves are not wise. Now, when we sin, the only person we need to look at is the Lord Jesus Christ. And as long as you're in the business of comparing, compare yourself to Him. Committed the sin, compare yourself to Him. Compare yourself to the standard that you read in the Bible and you will see how small you are. And you will see how sinful you really are. And you will see how uh, the sinful acts that you did are really something that God hates. And as, uh, until we realize that, we're not going to get over this sin that we, are, uh, we, when we, that we are doing. So confess our sins wholly to God. Confessing our sins wholly to God or, or confessing everything wholly to God is something that will make us realize the magnitude of sin. And what's good about confessing to God is that He's faithful to forgive us. He's not a person who's not listening to our confession. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes, God has forgiven all our sins already when we got saved, but now that we're believers, when we are sinning, we're affecting our fellowship with God. And when we confess, that is what we are, God is fixing, our fellowship with Him. And He is faithful and just to forgive us. Next is telling the whole truth encourages us to confess our sins. What, what do I mean by that? We realize that confession is not just about talking about your sin. Confession is also about confessing the goodness and the greatness of God. Now, the more you confess the goodness of God, the more you confess the greatness and the grace and the mercy of God, the more you will be invited to confess your sins to Him. Why? Because you realize His nature. You realize that though He's not, though He is he's a God who's, uh, who hates sin, but He's a God who forgives as well. And when you realize, truly believe, that He is a God who forgives, you will not be afraid to confess his sin. For example, you have a father who hits you every time you commit a mistake. You will not be encouraged to tell him something that he did not find out. Because you know he's just going to hit you anyway. But if you know that you have a father, though who he disciplines you, but loves you and forgives you and gives you a chance, will give you encouragement to admit to him the mistakes that even he didn't find out. Now, when we realize that God is a forgiving God, we, it, it encourages us to confess more to Him, to confess the sins that we do not want to let go of. Why? Because we know that He's a God that is gracious and will give us another chance. Romans chapter 2, verse 4 says, Or despises thou the riches of His goodness and forbearance and longsuffering. And I like this part, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. And if you, know, if you know as a sinner, if God will send you straight to hell once you confess your sins, you will not do that. But if you know that God is a God who is ready to forgive and to give you a second chance, it will not give you a double mind to confess and let go of that sin. Why? Siya rin naman ang tutulong sa atin. Alam naman niyang papatawa, papatawa, alam natin papatawarin niya tayo. Eh di mag-confess tayo sa kanya. And that gives us again uh, the, the ability or the confidence to confess to him. Why? If he's the one who forgives and forgets, forgets confess our sins to him. If, he is our, uh, if, if the Lord is our great physician, let us lay our wounds to him. If the Lord is the discerner of our hearts and the one who knows all our thoughts, let us pour out our hearts to him. If he's the one inviting us to come, let us not delay. Let us come and confess to God. And the sooner we do that, the better we will have a Christian life. And again, looking back at this chapter before I end, I want us to realize, and the challenge is to realize and to, to uh, admit the grace of God in our lives. That is something that is lacking in our lives. When we pray and ask God for forgiveness, we don't confess His goodness on the other side. Lord, patawarin niyo po ako, ginawa ko po ito. But Lord, I know that you're this, you're this and that. Now, when, even when we look at the model prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew, it's all about praising, thanking God. And even, even the, the forgiveness of sin, uh, the ask, asking for forgiveness is there. Even though supplication is there, it's just a small part. But uh, a, a bulk of that prayer is praising and thanking God for His goodness, His mercy, and His grace. And asking for the will of God in our lives. So while we confess, while we're at confessing our sins, while we're, at, we're doing that, also confess the goodness of God in our lives. Also never forget that God's grace is always upon us. And though we are unworthy, and though we are like the Israelites who do 
things wrong things again and again and again. God has always been gracious. I, I read something uh, the other day. Our sinfulness only plays a supporting role to God's greatness uh, and grace. Our sinfulness only plays a supporting role. To, that means uh, uh, the things that we do or the, things, the bad things that we do, sometimes we magnify it in our minds. But what we should magnify in our minds is the grace of God despite the things that we do. And, uh, and, and, and uh, I'm not saying minimize your sin. I'm just saying that look at God's grace bigger than your sin. Why? Kasi pag narealize natin yung mas lalo natin gugustuhin at tigilan yung kasalanan. The goodness of God leads to repentance. You know, if there's a person who is, uh, has a bad attitude, it's easy to say bad things towards him. But if a person is kind, uh, uh, saying good words, always doing good things to you, nakakonsensyang gawa ng masama. That is God. We see the goodness of God and because of the goodness and grace of God, it will lead you to repent. And to do nothing and say, Lord, tulungan niyo po ako na suklian ng katapatan and kabutihan yung binibigyan niyo sa akin. Though I will fail you, Lord, still, Lord, help me. Na kahit papaano, kahit, although I cannot really do anything about it or cannot really repay your grace, but at least in my own way and in my, the best of my abilities, to, to repay that grace of God. That's why, as I have said, it's even if you surrender your life, be full-time in the ministry, become a full-time preacher, it's still not enough to repay the goodness of God in your life. That's why do not uh, regret anything that you do for God. Do not regret anything that you give to God. Why? It's just a small uh, token of our appreciation. Giving our life to Him is just a small token of our appreciation. Why? He saved us from eternal damnation. He saved us from hell. And He is bringing us someday to heaven. And nothing we can do can ever uh, top that. And that's why the things that we do for Him are just something, are just small things compared to His grace and His glory. That's why do not regret those things. Giving your life to God, giving your everything to God is something that it's just should be a natural response to the goodness of God. It should just be a natural response to the grace of God in your life. That's why we should give our best. And that's why as uh, hangat kaya natin, gawin natin lahat para sa Panginoon. Hanggat kaya natin, lagi natin i-prioritize ang gawain ng Panginoon. As long as we can, let us prioritize coming to church. Let's prioritize the assembly of the brethren. Let us prioritize the ministry of God. Let's not put anything above that. Why? Because that, is not the, that should not be the response, our response to the goodness and greatness of God. That is something that is sinful in itself. That's why we should, as we realize the grace of God, we should appreciate more that God is letting us preach that God is letting us sing, that God is letting you teach in the outreach, appreciate that more. Why? Because you're not worthy. And you're, not, you're, ne you're never going to be worthy for those things. Yet, God is using you. It's a privilege. It's God's grace. It's God's faithfulness. Thank Him for that. And repay Him by giving your all and giving your best to Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this chapter. And we thank you, Lord, that as, even as we were reading this chapter, we are appreciating.